uh, good afternoon um, or good morning um, or good noon um, or good evening from wherever you are joining us uh, today to our online digital event, the 28th member, question mark, Ukraine's candidacy for EU membership. This is uh, the second cooperation um, event we are doing um, as Aspen Germany with the Aspen Institute Kiev. Um, and in these very difficult times, I want to express my sincere and heartfelt gratitude um, to the Aspen Kiev team for organizing these very, very meaningful and insightful meetings within the Aspen uh, family, um, sharing your insights and your knowledge with a wider audience, also including um, the German um, audience. And um, we do have um, our colleagues from, from Aspen um, Kiev with us today, um, some virtually, some with pre-recorded messages, um, and some who are unfortunately traveling and have a little bit of a problem um, logging on online. But um, we would like to start our meeting with a pre-recorded message by Natalie Yaresko. She is the chairperson um, of the Aspen Institute Kiev um, and former Ukrainian finance minister and a real powerhouse. And um, Emily, if you would play her video, that would be really great. Thank you to Aspen Institute Germany and Aspen Institute Kiev for organizing this incredibly important dialogue today about Ukraine's European integration. Ukraine is indeed a great European state, and Ukrainians are showing every day with their deeds that they value the ideals of a Europe whole, free, and at peace. They are laying down their lives. They are giving of everything they have to ensure the future of a Europe whole, free, and at peace. Today, Ukrainians seek recognition of the value that they bring to the, Euro to the European Union, and that would be candidacy on the, on the way to membership. Ukrainians understand that the membership process is a long and involved one, and that reforms will be necessary, and they are prepared to implement those reforms and begin that process. So today, I hope this dialogue brings us closer to a mutual understanding of the value of Ukraine in the European Union. Thank you. Um, and with this, um, I would like to hand over to uh, Dennis uh, Poltavitz also for some welcoming remarks from um, Aspen Kiev. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sormi. Uh, so I would like to say that uh, this uh, series of dialogues that we have with the different audiences of different countries in European Union, uh, basically the second dialogue. And we are extremely grateful to Aspen Germany for this opportunity to, let's say, to have this conversation, uh, because uh, it seems that uh, accession to European Union is quite an important uh, issue right now in Ukraine, uh, not only politically, but also it's a kind of uh, some vector uh, that Ukrainian society in unmasse sees as a future. <clears throat> so that's why uh, we think that it is important to have uh, such a discussions uh, that are uh, uh, valuable because uh, they are also done at the level of, let's say, people uh, or, let's say, leaders uh, of different sectors uh, and not only on political level, just to understand what are the concerns, what are the opportunities, what are the issues that should be addressed and thus to improve our mutual understanding. So this is my very hope for this event. Uh, and I am really grateful to all who is able, who was able to join. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Dennis, uh, for doing this with us. Um, and please also express our gratitude uh, to Julia and um, to the whole Aspen Kiev team um, for hanging in there and continuing your work um, from several different European uh, countries uh, where um, you are currently uh, placed and situated. Um, we really appreciate what you're doing. Um, taking a look at, at the topic of today, um, we looked at some polls and more than 86% of Ukrainians support EU membership. And it can be expected that during the next EU summit at the end of June, Ukraine is will be granted official EU candidates 
status. At least that's what we thought would probably most likely happen. Um, but there are still some questions uh, around this. Um, and uh, these are questions we would like to discuss with our panelists today, but then also with our audience. Um, and this is um, how the process would look like on the way to accession, how the timeline would look like, and um, if the other EU member states are ready for this, um, and what the opinion is among the EU member states, but certainly also um, if uh, what, uh, what is happening in Ukraine itself um, and what needs to happen to also ensure um, a quick accession, um, because we also don't want um, a bogged down road to accession as we have seen with some other countries. So lots of questions we want to discuss today. And we have a group of really excellent speakers with us today and real experts um, and policy makers, opinion makers, action makers. And I would like to introduce uh, the panel to you. Um, first, let me introduce Oleksiy Chernyshov. I am really bad with Ukrainian last names. Um, so I hope I'm not butchering them too much. And please excuse me, I'm, I, I practiced and I'm trying hard. Um, Oleksiy, so thank you so much for being here today. Um, you are the Minister for Communities and Territories Development of Ukraine, and you have been doing so since March 2020. Um, previously, you served as head of Kiev Regional State Administration. In 2014, you established Kiev um, Vision Foundation, um, uh, dealing with investment attraction, cultural project support, promoting Ukraine and Europe through the modern Ukrainian art potential. So you bring all sorts of different expertise with you. And I hope that we, um, and, and you have just returned from Germany. Um, and we are very much looking forward to hearing from you um, and listening to your impressions from what's going on in Berlin. Um, thank you so much, um, Oleksiy, for being here today. Thank you very much, Stormy. Um, hello to everyone. Uh, you do the pronunciation of uh, Ukrainian last name very good. And, uh, thank you for that. Uh, I'm sorry I cannot offer you such an exotic background as Natalie Yureska offered you previously, but I, I think uh, um, I will provide you with some uh, factual information from uh, our side. Uh, so with your permission, I would, I would like to have uh, some brief points on uh, our current status where we stand with the uh, provision of EU candidate, candidate status to Ukraine. Uh, so, uh, first of all, I'm happy to have this meeting and uh, the ability uh, to convey this message to the Aspen community, to the Aspen family. Uh, it is a big honor to be here with Aspen Germany. Uh, first of all, I would like to convey uh, the message of uh, gratitude and gratefulness from Ukrainian people to the people of Germany, especially uh, uh, from your family of Aspen for the unprecedented support uh, that we have experienced over the course of last more than 100 days. Uh, this is a historical moment for all of us, and I'm sure the generations of Ukrainians and Germans will remember this forever. Uh, coming uh, to the main topic of our discussion, uh, I have just uh, returned from a German trip. Uh, from my background that you have uh, uh, presented, uh, presented me, I also have another function being a special envoy uh, from the president of Ukraine for promoting EU candidate status in Europe. And uh, there are countries uh, that uh, I'm responsible for, and Germany is one of them. And uh, it is very interesting uh, to share uh, the views uh, of the outcome of these discussions. I have been meeting with uh, uh, German federal government and uh, the federal ministers, as well as uh, uh, mayors of uh, uh, German cities, including Berlin, as in Dusseldorf and, and others, uh, some uh, uh, business uh, representatives, as well as regional authorities. Uh, for us, it was very important uh, to have the regional outlook in Germany, given the fact Germany is a big and decentralized country 
and uh, the opinion of regions and the influence of regions is very important. So uh, our agenda, first of all, uh, we would like to see the strength of European Union embracing Ukraine. So why Ukraine needs to be a member of European Union, I think it's absolutely obvious and clear. Uh, we should find the answer why European Union is in a position to consider Ukraine being a new member. Uh, and from that perspective, we want this to be a really skeptical outlook and not to consider this out of sorrow or out of the current military situation and out of war, which we are currently experiencing, which of course affects uh, this situation and might affect this decision. Nevertheless, uh, we should look at this at, uh, from absolutely skeptical perspective. And uh, from that point of view, I think we have the common ground with German politicians and German officials. So I would, with your permission, uh, briefly uh, uh, stop on main points. Uh, we are sure that European Union will become more stable, more secure, more modern, more, more dynamic, more prosperous with Ukrainian integration. For sure, it will take time for Ukraine to become a member state. And uh, this, this will be the years to come. We cannot tell exactly. But nevertheless, uh, Ukraine is not looking for a fast track or a back door to the European Union. Ukraine is the country that is in a position to start integration from provision of candidate status. And uh, I think this more a more political decision is now about to come. Ukraine has signed the association agreement with the European Union in 2014. Since then, Ukraine has been in a war with Russia. So eight years we have been fighting, practically defending European values and democracy. During this time, we have implemented a number of steps, especially in progressing reforms and structural reforms uh, in order to execute this association agreement and get closer to the integration. We have analyzed and came to a conclusion that 63% is the current progress in execution of these criteria. And uh, several strategic things have been implemented in Ukraine already starting from uh, public procurement, electronic declaration system, then uh, digital transformation, which Ukraine is a champion in, and many more. And I think that uh, Ukraine is absolutely ready to start this race uh, in, for the European integration, is absolutely ready to be a candidate. And uh, June 24 is our date when uh, the decision is about to be uh, announced. We expect uh, the, uh, the report uh, that will be public uh, later this week and uh, the member states will receive it. Of course, we will need the anonymous decision from the member states. Uh, we've been working with uh, some skeptical countries over the course of last six weeks very intensively. And uh, I am in a position to state that we expect a positive decision on provision Ukraine, a candidate uh, status. Uh, from that way, we should look at Ukraine uh, in Ukraine as a country that gives uh, great potential to the European Union. And uh, I start with the security issue. Uh, and I'm not talking about the physical security, but we should never forget Ukraine has an actual army in Europe right now and the bravest, the bravest army in Europe right now. But I'm talking about the food security. Uh, we all understand Ukraine is a, a strategic player on the world security, food security market. We see the dependence of uh, other countries in Africa and Middle East uh, to the uh, products Ukraine is exporting and uh, it is definitely uh, a really a huge uh, from one side an instrument from another side uh, security food security element for the European Union. 
another thing is of course uh, ukrainian human capital uh, we all know about it and i think it's clearly understood that it's already uh, partially integrated into the uh, european economy then we can speak about uh, the uh, 32 million of hectares of ukrainian cultivated land and again uh, agro segment then information technology it uh, which is a, again ukraine is a champion in digitalization and we are uh, i think the most digitalized uh, nation uh, in european union for the moment and it's absolutely obvious and uh, many more other uh, reasons that uh, brings uh, ukraine uh, to the uh, European Union membership. Uh, again, uh, it is uh, obvious Ukraine is the member of the European family. Uh, and I want to add that Ukraine is a proven member of the European family. And uh, Ukraine is eager to start its preparation for uh, the European integration to become a member of the European Union. And uh, I think uh, it, it is uh, a historical moment that we are facing. Uh, it might happen uh, so sooner than in two weeks. And hopefully, uh, we will start our journey uh, that in, during which we will have to execute several structural reforms, change our infrastructure, do a lot of homework. But anyway, this guidance from the European Union is absolutely in need uh, for Ukraine to be prepared, uh, the sooner the better. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I want to express uh, absolutely huge gratitude uh, to Aspen Germany. Uh, again, we feel a huge level of support. We understand that more than 60%, 62% of German people support uh, Ukrainian membership in the European Union. Uh, we think that provision of candidate status will bring more support. Uh, we feel it from the every meeting uh, in Germany, you know, like in uh, Berlin and in the regions. And uh, I'm sure that we are moving forward. Uh, there is a, a highest political meetings uh, expected uh, to come in the next days. Uh, and uh, I think we will, it will prove uh, this way uh, forward. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, this has been very insightful and very helpful. Um, I have tons of follow up questions, but we leave that for the discussion, um, because I would also like now to introduce our um, other speakers, our other panelists, before we then um, get uh, to the discussion. To my to my questions and to the discussion, it's um, it's a real pleasure um, to also welcoming Olena Halushka. Um, Olena, thank you so much for joining us uh, today. Um, she is a civil society activist um, and uh, ed advo advocating for reforms um, in Ukraine. She's a co-founder of the Warsaw-based the International Center for v Ukrainian Victory and a board member of the Ukrainian NGO Anti-Corruption Action Center. Um, and um, she has been awarded many, many uh, distinctions, including the Robert Schumann Institute and uh, Budapest Award um, of Women of Political Influence, uh, the uh, fellowship in 2013. Thank you so much uh, for being here today. Um, I also warmly welcome Maria Metzenseva. Um, she is the chairperson of the Ukrainian delegation to the Parliamentary, Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, um, Deputy Chairperson of the Committee on Ukraine's Integration into the European Union. And um, we are very much looking forward to hearing from you um, what needs to happen on the road um, to membership. And it's also a very, very great pleasure welcoming um, Natalia Yemchenko. Um, Natalia, thank you so much for making time being here today. Thank you. Um, you are um, the Director of Public Relations and Communications in SCM. And just in case our some of our audience doesn't know what that is, it's uh, Ukraine's largest investment group um, that has a very global presence um, with focus on metals, mineral mining, energy, 
banking, finance, media, telecom, so a really wide portfolio. And I'm very glad that you joined us today because you also bring in um, the voice of business, um, but you also, um, as you hold the position of the head of the editorial board of the TV channel Ukraine, you also bring in a media perspective, which is also great for our discussion today. And um, Natalia is another power woman, um, I have to say. Um, she had uh, been um, among the four Ukraine magazine, 33 women who made themselves. Um, very impressive. Thank you so much for um, joining us uh, today. And um, Natalia, if I may start with you, um, and maybe you could um, tell us a little bit about the economic situation currently in Ukraine, but also what you would tell um, skeptical voices outside the Ukraine, what the advantages, the econ economic advantages of Ukrainian membership would be for the, for the EU. We heard from Oleksiy that there is, that there is a big or there should be a big self-interest um, on the side of the European Union, but um, I think not everybody sees that. Um, and maybe you can explain that to us. Um, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for organize, uh, organizers for this panel. And uh, also thank you uh, all audience for uh, interest. Germany is one of the biggest partners of Ukraine and we uh, do appreciate that. Uh, I know it uh, both from my working experience and uh, private experience as far as my kids finish the school. Two, two of my, I have four, two of my kids finish uh, the school in Germany. So uh, I do from my personal experience that this support is not only on paper, on statistics, it's real support uh, all over the country and uh, uh, on the human, on, on the ordinary people level, it's extremely, extremely, extremely practical and real. Uh, so thanks for that. Um, um, probably I will start from uh, the point that uh, Ukrainian business is ready for EU candidacy and integration. What does it mean for us? Uh, I would definitely would talk from um, uh, from the face of SCM. So I would I would you know uh, tell something which I know from practice from my job. But uh, I do believe that actually it's quite fair for uh, all Ukrainian business. Uh, first of all, I just would like to support the uh, Alexei's that uh, our country is uh, more than ready uh, for candidacy status. And if you would compare the situation in Ukraine, even now, even uh, with respect to the war, uh, it's very in line in time to time, even better than uh, it was the stage of other countries when they received the status. So we do a lot of job. Uh, we did a lot of job and we do understand that it's you know, uh, there is a lot of uh, things to do uh, in the future. Um, but we are, as a Ukrainian business, would like to claim and to pledge uh, that uh, we do believe that uh, uh, our European integration, uh, in European integration is a win-win uh, story for Ukrainian business and for EU economy. Uh, we are, as a biz biggest business, do understand that uh, uh, we would be forced to compete uh, with uh, European uh, business, and we are ready for that. Uh, we are ready to play on European rules. Uh, more than that, we are ready to help Ukraine and Ukrainian econ uh, economy uh, to uh, make some uh, structural reforms where it, where it is necessary. Uh, to do a further progress, uh, we know that uh, we have some zones for, for improvement. For example, uh, it's really um, a lot of stuff to do uh, on the uh, on the point of rule of law, and we do believe that uh, uh, our, our candidacy status will help uh, Ukraine to move faster on this track. We're definitely ready for that, and uh, we are, as a business, are interested more than anybody else uh, to see the progress in Ukraine and uh, in Ukraine, which is in the process of integration to Europe. So it's not only um, some local issue, it's definitely uh, an issue uh, which would help us to uh, move to the Euro integration. Um, 
uh, we do believe that the, the European uh, vector uh, for U uh, Ukrainian economy is challenging uh, from one side, but from other side, it's not something we would like to, you know, to do with some preferences. Uh, we are ready to do it uh, uh, on the basis of fair partnership, fair com uh, competition. And um, from my point of view, it's not something, uh, it's, it's not wishful thinking. It's a fact. Uh, I would like to, you know, to to give you a couple of examples. For example, uh, probably you know that uh, Ukraine, exactly on the day when war was started by Russia, um, was on the planned process of uh, disconnecting from Russia energy um, uh, environment. I don't know in English, Russia energy field like, and connecting to European one. It was like a short, it, it should be like a short experiment uh, for four days, like test. Um, uh, the whole process named NCE, uh, when we were moving uh, out of Russia toward the Ukraine from the point of view uh, of uh, energy society, and it, it was a plan. And definitely after war was started, uh, we never was uh, connected to Russia uh, Energy Society again, and we we are already the part of Europe from the point of view of energy connection. And the tech, one of our biggest businesses, energy business, one was the biggest ambassador of this uh, European movement from the point of view of energy. Uh, it's really important to you know to say that it's not only because uh, we would like. To be symbolically part of Europe. It's just because we are a big and very important partner in energy security. It's exactly what Alexei said. We are already, but our potential, but, but uh, our potential, uh, potential as an energy partner for Europe is huge. It's amazing. Uh, we could be, we could help Europe to uh, compensate. Uh, the um, loss of Russian coal, coal or an, an other Russian energy, including gas, uh, until 230, you know, in a, up to 30%. So uh, this partnership is uh, not something which need uh, some, you know, magic stuff. It's absolutely a real story. It's absolutely a real plan. And this candidacy uh, could help uh, Ukraine understand that Europe really wanted and uh, to invest hardly in uh, our uh, green energy, in gas development, so in uh, clean type of energies uh, to, you know, to support Europe in this transition. Uh, um, uh, the same story with uh, our competition on huge amount of markets. So we are already uh, very strong in competition. So it, it wouldn't be a shock for Ukrainian economy. Uh, but Ukraine, when we would be sure and would understand that Europe really treat us as a partner, uh, could also be big, uh, big like uh, big part of uh, movement uh, of Europe toward uh, the strategic autonomy. It's a term which we use uh, in a lot of economic discussions with Europe uh, after COVID and especially after the war. Europe is thinking about strategic autonomy. Uh, and uh, definitely we are talking about uh, energy autonomy, food autonomy or security, but in the same time production autonomy and uh, we are talking about some um, production crisis connected with um, broken logistics with China, for example, and definitely Ukraine could and would be a very good uh, partner in production facilities. Uh, and again, we need to uh, invest a lot in that, uh, and we need a signal that uh, Europe treats, uh, is ready to treat us as a partner in this field. Definitely, we are talking about uh, defense and security issues, and Alexei said that uh, it, ha it happened, so it's not something which was planned, it happened. Uh, Ukraine is definitely... Uh, with respect of huge progress of team of uh, Vladimir Zelensky in digital, in uh, digital tr uh, transition, uh, could be a big and very, very, you know, energized and um, I would say effective partner in, in digitalization because uh, uh, these digital uh, services and digital progress is really unavoidable for uh, Ukrainian development. 
oh, you know, we need to, you know, to, to do a lot of effort to change ourselves. And in this process, we create a lot of services, facilities, ecosystems, uh, which could work uh, and which could support uh, the further development of uh, the whole Europe and Europe economy. And um, uh, definitely it's a huge and very important question of logistics and logistic uh, and new logistic, uh, uh, which would, you know, definitely uh, would create, I don't know in English, uh, in Russian we said Trimoria, three C's, like uh, it's uh, new uh, trade, uh, trade routes uh, based on three C's, the Baltic Sea, uh, Black Sea and Mediterranean Sea. And it's a huge, um, I would say, uh, historical and in the same time, uh, um, very, you know, new up-to-date uh, project uh, which could create absolutely new opportunities and new uh, economical drivers uh, for uh, new Europe, I mean Ukraine and uh, other countries and for the uh, big Europe uh, in the same time and uh, it's definitely you know could create uh, absolutely new um, um, uh, absolutely new landscape uh, of, of trade, of production, etc. And I could talk a lot about that. Uh, I'm really passionate about the opportunities. Um, this strategic autonomy issue is not something which could, you know, um, which could uh, disappear. This question is uh, already on the European agenda. And actually, there is no better partner for uh, um, solving this issue than Ukraine. Um, uh, why we believe that uh, uh, this candidacy signal is vital for us? Uh, we are in a very, very, very uh, tough battle with, uh, uh, with Russia. And uh, this battle is not only about you know, some border solace. This battle uh, is battle for uh, European values, definitely. But also this battle for uh, our belief, deep belief, uh, that uh, uh, we have enough uh, brave and uh, um, I would say face and strength uh, to uh, create a new future for us. Uh, and unfortunately, our enemy is so big that it's absolutely impossible to do by our own. And uh, we need some particular th signals, which will uh, give us an understanding that, you, that for Europe, we are not only the land, but, but also the partner. Uh, we, absolutely sure that we will win. I mean, uh, without this, uh, without uh, this, you know, this, uh, this message, it, it has no sense. All, all, uh, all, uh, all our efforts has no sense. And then uh, definitely it would be modernization of Ukraine. And definitely Europe uh, would be part of this modernization uh, on the level of institutional donors. Uh, but this modernization is a huge market is a huge market and Ukraine is a huge market. And without the signal, I don't think that European investors would be ready to invest in this modernization. Institutions, yes, like EBRD, IMF, etc. cetera. But uh, uh, investors, I don't think so. And then we will see here in Ukraine, other investors from China, from Middle East, etc. They will come, they are more risky. Uh, they definitely not, not the guys with European values but they would be interesting just to, you know, bring their money over here. Uh, as far as you know, the nature is not tolerant for, um, I don't know English, sorry, uh, for the empathy. So uh, any market uh, would receive a money. And the question is, uh, what is the region of this money? We would prefer European money, European partners, uh, European corporations. But if Europe would choose not to, you know, treat us as a partner, uh, unfortunately, somebody else would come and it's unavoidable. So this is why the signal is absolutely uh, practical, not only for Ukraine, but also for Europe. Uh, it's like a message that we, we need this market, we, be, we believe in this market, we want this market.
that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and also for underlining what an important signal that is and for explaining um, so persuasively why it is also in the interest of the European Union um, and that it is not just a sign of solidarity, but there is a real preg pragmatic interest behind it. Uh, thank you so much, Natalia, for making that so clear. Um, EU membership um, and the road to EU membership is, is pretty tough and can be pretty rocky. And we have seen that with new members, especially in the Balkans, the Western Balkans, where some of the processes have run down into uh, blockages, um, have been very slow um, and a lot of internal um, opposition form made it, um, but also within the European Union, there was very little appetite, at least in some countries, for quick accession and accession. So it's a tough, it's a it's a really tough process. Um, because there is a huge body of EU law and regulations. Huge. So Olena, I wanted to ask you. Um, what needs to happen in the Ukraine? We heard that the Ukraine is ready um, for the process, but in the process um, of accession, what needs to happen? Thank you very much for having me here at this panel discussion. Um, well, I, I would probably like to focus mostly on the uh, anti-corruption and rule of law aspect of what Ukraine needs to be done, because that's my of expertise, and that's basically um, what is very often discussed by the politicians when we uh, are talking about Ukraine's uh, candidate status. We often hear that you haven't yet fought corruption and you are already uh, aiming uh, for, for the uh, EU accession. Um, uh, well, actually, uh, I would like to agree with the, with the previous speakers who said that we started our democratic transformation uh, in 2014. And ever since we are doing this simultaneously while we are fighting against Russian aggression. Obviously, it's significantly scaled up since the 24th of February, but uh, it was there all the time during the last eight years. And uh, during this time, despite the fact that uh, we had to fight two wars simultaneously, we managed to achieve tremendous progress, which we as the civil society are right now urging the uh, EU member states to recognize. And we had like two statements issued um, just over the last months one with a focus on the anti-corruption reform and the second one with, with a more wider focus. Um, because when while the European Union is reluctant to acknowledge the huge progress Ukraine has done to fight against corruption, um, one person has already done this, and this is Vladimir Putin. In his uh, speech two days before the war on the 21st of February, he named and listed all of the anti-corruption institutions which we managed to establish in Ukraine. Uh, he attacked the ongoing judicial reform, claiming that we gave up our sovereignty because we started cleansing the judicial governance bodies with the participation of the uh, brilliant uh, reputation, uh, external uh, experts, outsiders, uh, and as the result of, of this uh, reform, 70% of the members, uh, corrupt members of the judicial governance bodies, resigned themselves because they know that they won't pass the scrutiny and they did not even want to, uh, to, to, to be uh, fired with a scandal. Um, Ukraine managed to uh, introduce a lot of different transparency tools like, again, electronic asset declaration system with all of the public officials, starting with the president, ending with the um, village council members have to declare their income and assets. And it is not only about transparency. The accountability comes in case there is the mismatch between the official incomes and the lifestyles of officials. Uh, all public procurements, which previously used to be a huge corruption loophole with the uh, uh, prices overstated by 20, 50 percent, uh, are right now moved into online electronic system Prozoro, which uh, according to the estimations helps 
uh, not only to avoid corruption, but even to reduce the prices uh, of the procurement because uh, the, the bidding is done uh, on the uh, competitive uh, approach of auction system. Um, obviously, we managed to build from scratch anti-corruption institutions that are tasked with um, fighting against high-profile corruption. And they managed to prove that there are no untouchables uh, in Ukraine anymore. And uh, as the last uh, institution, anti-corruption court, uh, started to be operational only in 2019, so it has been working for two years. And um, as of now, more than um, 50 uh, verdicts are already fully enacted. So they passed the first and the second uh, instance. And these are mostly cases against uh, judicial bribery, but also there are cases against members of parliament, uh, former ministers. This is a very clear signal to the system that business as usual, uh, which used to be blooming before the revolution of dignity uh, is not working anymore. And frankly speaking, for me as the person who has been dedicated, who has dedicated seven years of, of my professional uh, uh, work for the fighting against corruption, uh, it, it hurts uh, to hear that Ukraine is a fragile democracy, uh, that Ukraine is a failed state because not only the government, not only the parliament is working during the war time, but even anti-corruption institutions are working. NABU is sending cases to court. Uh, the court has um, uh, issued nine verdicts since the 24th um, of February. Um, the agencies uh, confiscated um, uh, assets uh, of corrupt proceeds uh, and uh, bails. Uh, uh, amounting to $15 million, uh, and this money was sent directly to the needs of the armed forces, meaning that not only justice is being served, but there is a very practical dimension of the uh, ongoing fight against corruption, which was not disrupted by the, uh, by the war. Uh, the judicial reform, which I said, it was uh, disrupted for a few weeks when the, war, when the large scale war started, but it was recently resumed. And we are expecting to, to have the first stage of the full rebuttal uh, of the judicial governance bodies to be complete by uh, 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 over the next few months. And um, that is why we uh, are absolutely uh, convinced that Ukraine has already uh, deserved EU candidate status. We are not asking, you know, for a gift. We are not asking for the loan. We are asking the uh, European partners uh, to recognize those achievements that are already in place. Uh, and after uh, we will receive the EU candidate status, and we really hope that this will happen already the next uh, Thursday and Friday, uh, that afterwards we will be granted the long list of reforms, which we still have to uh, do on our way to getting the uh, full EU uh, membership. And we as the civil society will make maximum use of that list. And here we will be pushing for the, um, the, the full and comprehensive judicial reform because it started only with the judicial governance bodies, but it has to go down to, to, to the level of courts, cleaning them from the um, uh, corrupt crooks. We will be pushing for the anti-monopoly committee because that's a very important pillar of the real uh, and effective the oligarchization. Uh, we will make sure that anti-corruption reform is sustainable and continues operating and that agencies are not falling under the political pressure or uh, any kind of undue influence. So yes, there is still homework to be done, but the most effective leverage for us as the civil society would be EU candidate status first, and then the long list of reforms. That's something which worked well for the Visa Liberalization Action Plan, which was one of the most powerful tools uh, for us to uh, advocate for the reforms uh, previously. Uh, and that's something which we are expecting to get from the uh, European partners uh, as well. 
Uh, and I would also like to, to stress, um, to support um, what a previous speaker said, that um, EU candidate status is a very important signal for the post-war recovery and post-war reconstruction. And because we also consider that this post-war recovery and the money which will uh, come into Ukraine and this EU candidate status and the framework which will follow to, to, to make sure that all the economic and rule of law reforms are complete, are irreversible and are fully done. I mean, both these tools should go in synergy. They should amplify each other and they should go together. And that is why, again, we will be using the next week to, to keep convincing our partners because this is only the beginning of our road, we as the society are very much committed to make Ukrainian authorities do all these reforms for sure, for real. And together we can be doing uh, much better and much more uh, than separately. Thank you very much um, for zooming in into um, I would say almost one of the most important topics um, on the way um, to membership and for also explaining to us um, that there are different levels and different parts of, of, the, of the constitutional setup which need to be addressed. Um, and thank you also so much, Olena, for explaining to us what has already been done, um, but for also putting a spotlight on what needs to be done on down the road. Um, and we now heard a lot about what um, the EU would gain um, from uh, membership. Um, but I would also be interested in hearing um, from Maria um, if all Ukrainians um, are behind um, the idea of EU membership and what is expected to get out of EU membership. Um, because we also, I mean, I think the EU is a wonderful, wonderful thing, which led to peace, stability, prosperity, and so on. But we also have our problems, right, within the European Union. Um, and I wanted to hear from you um, what you tell skeptics within Ukraine, um, what, why it would make a lot of sense for Ukraine to be part of the EU uh, membership family. Uh -huh. Feel dank, dear Annika. Thank you very much, dear friends. And I think I will have to change the question a little bit, if I may, because uh, having a having a very concrete number, according to the recent polls, of over eighty six percent, and I think it's overlapping ninety already percent of the future full membership. Talking about the candidacy, I think the number can be even higher. Uh, so within Ukraine, the mood and the, uh, the level of support since the 24th of February has definitely changed dramatically, increasing by over 20% plus within uh, a little bit more than 100 days. It's a great result. Why it did happen so? Because we have very successful reforms, which are um, which might, might have a very general names, but when you start explaining it at the level of the constituencies at different regions, whether that would be the, uh, the Donbass area or the south of Ukraine, central Kiev, western, northern part, doesn't matter, but it's about the everyday life. European integration is, is nothing to do with, you know, some unforeseen perspective in the future. That's what we are living already today. That's about more than 80 laws that Ukrainian parliament of the nine convocation has managed to pass easily with a vast majority and sometimes constitutional majority of support. And that does take um, a uh, for us a great opportunity to look at them technically. So it's about the uh, air pollution. It's about the food, the baby food safety. You know, I was literally in tears when we passed it in the whole of the parliament because it has never been at place for 30 years of the existence of Ukraine. It's about the waste management law, which we will vote in the beginning of next week. And regardless, the bumpy road Sanika, you've mentioned every law has a bumpy road. Even getting back on track with the responsibility for fake declarations for um, representatives of different level 
of society, not only politicians, but everyone who is dealing with the government was a matter of a week. So I would say the political will of the parliament was specifically there from 2019, so that the progress with uh, which was mentioned by the minister Chernyshov of a 63% was there also because of the political will. And it wasn't, you know, a dimension of political parties. I think we are as now team Ukraine in the same manner when we talk about European integration from 2019. So it takes uh, a little uh, wider perspective since the full-scale invasion. Uh, we understand how challenging it was from the 2014, but the very prominent reform of the decentralization when now from the very bottom level of the local, uh, let's say, leaders, population, citizens, up to the bottom to Kiev, people can decide for themselves about the taxes to be spent, about the uh, taxes to be actually incorporated in the daily life what do we transfer it transfer it for uh I am I am speaking right now from the second largest city, Kharkiv, which has been targeted every night. So let's say last night it was more or less okay in the in in the in the town itself, but not at the outskirts. But the the night before, seven missiles attacked uh, well my constituency and beyond. So I would call it a candidacy under the rockets, a candidacy regardless the war, a candidacy which is a political decision and a candidacy which is fairly, uh, which should be fairly awarded to Ukraine. And I, I would definitely agree with Elena when, when she said that it's not a gift taken. That's some, some very hard homework we've been um, going through. And I think energy uh, dimension having a say that there was the fourth day of the full scale invasion when we uh, managed to connect to the energy system, exporting electricity abroad right now, being absolutely out of, of any deals with Russia and Belarus is a great achievement. Even though by many experts, it was promised to be done sometime by 2027. Well, this is a progress for sure. Uh, talking about energy, we still have a great chance to promote ourselves in the alternative energy, wind and water, for instance. We still have 600 billion cubic meters of, the, uh, of our natural gas, but volunteering uh, as a member of a Green Deal, we definitely understand that those 9.4 billion euros spent on the Nord Stream 2, we could have jointly invested with partners to something else, but more beautiful in perspective in terms of the future energy sector for all of us, for the whole subcontinent of Europe. We should not forget also uh, you know, the, the human rights dimension and it touches upon every Ukrainian family right now and beyond. And we're so thankful to the EU partners who support the, um, the perspective of the international, uh, international tribunal uh, and of course the contribution to ICC cases and the collection of, of the evidence uh, across Ukraine. And this is where uh, you, dear friends, also as... Um, German partners and beyond contribute a lot because it's not only about what would happen on the 24th, it's about the justice that has to prevail uh, for every uh, human being who is witnessing now these atrocities, whether it's directly or indirectly. It's about the more than 5 million in, uh, temporarily displaced persons, which you are hosting as Germany and of course are your other EU member states. It's about not proving our European identity but coming back to the roots of our common identity. And this, this traces us back to more philosophical uh, um, points uh, for other essays in the universities or PhDs. I'm sure that would be a topic for some PhD works being done. But I would also come back to the economic point of view and we thank to, the, uh, to your contribution in Germany, to Sula von der Leyen, Commission, European Commission decision for 
taken away the um, technical barriers where we actually implemented 100% of our commitments as a country within the association agreement. And for the next year, we will try the waiver of the uh, trade barriers. That pushes us a little bit further to the possible signature of the ACA agreement, which is also a great perspective for added values uh, products of Ukraine to be exported. So the access to the largest market of 508 million people is already there. That's under the conditions of Aki, of the association agreement. Uh, the, uh, th that's not the declaration. That's, that's a thing being already implemented. Of course, you know, we can talk a lot about Article 49, Western Balkans, 13 years of being a candidate, Ukraine being in a different group, different circumstances, having the hardest association agreement to implement, regardless of all that, in the country which is at war with all institutions being functioning, courts being functioning, anti-corruption uh, infrastructure being functioning, business paying taxes, having more than 1,200 companies being registered in the platform, online platform DIA since the 24th of February, all that proves Ukrainians are ready and deserve this status to be voted upon on the 24th of, of uh, next week. And we are uh, so anticipating this potential arrival of the, um, I call them uh, a super trio, uh, Italy, France, and Germany representatives to the capital. And I'm sure they would pass such a direct man message to the countries that have called or sometimes were, let's say, opposing the status or were neutral. We have seen a 180 degrees turn, U-turn of Austria, for instance, where, where Mr. Chernyshov was and us with delegates quite recently. And that's impressive. That proves that being very technical in um, reporting on our um, achievements, uh, takes a matter of fact that it will it, it 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 is something that might not be well known for our partners. So I think if the visit happens, that would pass an extra extra um, technical message to to our, our partners across the EU. So fingers crossed. On my side, I remain Euro positive. Euro, 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 there are, there there's all, there might be Euro skepticism at every stage. You know, when you are tired of pushing some laws, uh, and you think it's impossible. Well, Ukraine is brave, and I suggest our EU partners to be as brave as Ukraine. Vielen Dank. Thank you so much, especially for the last words. Um, I think um, it's it it is amazing how brave. The Ukrainian people are, and um, you're fighting our fight uh, for us. And you're right to say that we also need to be brave. Um, thank you so much for underlying uh, underlying this. Um, and um, before we come to also a Q and A, because I'm already seeing that um, our participants, like Johannes Alefeld, have already written um, in the chat function. I also want to bring in um, Natalie Forsik. Um, Natalie, um, it's, uh, it's great that you're joining us uh, for the discussion and for the Q&A. Um, she serves as Director General of, government, uh, of Governmental Office on European Integration and NATO, and you have been doing so since uh, 2021, and um, also working as um, Deputy Minister of Infrastructure of Ukraine since 2019. And um, I would like to bring you into the discussion to tell us um, not just what um, needs to be done in, the U in, in Ukraine and what needs to be done in the EU, but um, since we are at the Aspen Institute and we are always also very interested in transatlantic relations, um, maybe you can also tell us a little bit about the triangle um, of Ukraine, um, the United States um, and the European Union. Natalie. Oh dear, I hope we have not lost her now. Emily, maybe you could uh, briefly check if we have a little bit of a technical problem. 
I don't see her in the participation list anymore. Oh dear, um, I just saw her, um, saw her, saw her picture, um, and um, now I guess we have lost her. Well, um, Emily, keep me um, posted when she rejoins so that I hand over to her immediately. Um, but then I would suggest that we go um, into the discussion, and as it is always practice, um, please raise your electronic hand um, so that I know um, that I can call on you. Um, we would love rather do this um, instead of reading um, the questions or comments from the chat function. And um, so I wanted to ask you, Hannes, um, if you want to come into the discussion um, and, uh, and tell us a little bit um, about what you um, have to say. And I'm seeing that Johannes is still with us. Um, okay, um, <laughs> this is uh, turning into a technically challenged um, meeting. I think we are all ready for on-site meetings, um, but um, this, uh, no problem at all. Then I'm just going to, ah, unfortunately I'm off. Okay, I see. Um, so, uh, I will still convey what Johannes wrote um, into um, the chat function, and the first one is with regard to digitalization of Ukraine and how advanced uh, Ukraine is. He mentioned that um, Estonia is also very well advanced, and it would be very interesting to learn and to hear a little bit more um, why um, I think it was Olena um, or Natalia, one of you said that um, Ukraine is one of the most digitalized countries in the EU. And maybe you can explain that a little bit further. I think it was uh, Alexei and uh, then oh. me said it. Yeah, um, uh, actually uh, Estonia was uh, uh, our like, um, role model and uh, inspirational partner in the very beginning. And uh, the point is that uh, we have quite a strong and uh, fast growing IT uh, cluster, IT sector, uh, which is in a very deep cooperation with a special ministry of digitalization. Uh, do uh, the digital transformation in in the extremely fast and very, I would say, uh, client-oriented uh, way. So DIA, which was mentioned, is governmental application in which we have services which actually, honestly, uh, does not exist in most countries of Europe. For example, I have all my documents in one application, like passport, driver license, uh, social insurance. I do not have physical uh, documents with me, the same with COVID certificate, uh, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So, and actually, it's not something which is with us for years. Uh, the idea started two years ago, and uh, this amazing progress. All together with Estonia, yes, again, as far as Estonia is one of our very reliable partners. And uh, for example, we have uh, some ambassadors of Estonian tech uh, in Ukraine. We have, uh, for example, Yannika Mirila. I don't know, probably uh, the guy who asked us know her. So it's not a miracle and it's not a claim. It's uh, some process, ongoing process. And the speed and quality of this process is really something we would be happy to share. Thank you uh, very much uh, for that explanation. Um, Johannes Alefeld um, also had a question um, to Olena um, with regard to um, uh, corruption, but also with regard to the role of oligarchs um, in the country and with regard to uh, campaign, uh, political campaign financing. Um, and could you maybe also um, say something about that topic? Uh -huh. Yes, um, though it is not my direct sphere of expertise, I'm not uh, following that issue very closely, but I have to tell you that uh, Ukraine has achieved progress with regards to political party financing monitoring as well. Uh, we introduced the state uh, uh, party financing, so all those political parties that are in the government that passed the certain threshold, 
um, they uh, receive uh, state budget financing. So that was done as one of the uh, tools and instruments to decrease the uh, influence of oligarchs over uh, Ukrainian politics. Uh, also, uh, we have uh, introduced um, a more advanced um, monitoring of, uh, well, basically reporting itself, because uh, previously, before this reform started, this reporting was very uh, kind of window dressing. And um, right now, all the parties are uh, expected to uh, submit the reports about the incomes and um, the expenditures. Uh, which is uh, very important to the National Agency for Corruption Prevention. For a certain period of time, this reform was stalled because we didn't have the operational uh, National Agency for Corruption Prevention because the previous, though it was a newly established agency, um, the first attempt uh, to uh, select its leadership um, failed and the new leadership which unblocked the operations uh, of the agency was um, uh, 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 selected on the, in the beginning of 2019. Um, and, but uh, still we already have a few cases uh, where the state financing was suspended because the uh, reports were not uh, uh, corresponding to the legislation. Um, uh, right now, to my best knowledge, this uh, reform is um, stalled. Uh, th that was one of the moves which the parliament took uh, in relation to COVID. Um, but uh, I'm sure that it is very high uh, uh, on, the, on our agenda. It is considered to be as one of the tools of um, fighting against uh, political corruption. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that this reform will be resumed uh, when uh, the war allows and Ukrainian citizens and the journalists and the civil society would be able to keep an eye uh, on the um, financing and uh, on the spendings of the political parties. But obviously, uh, a lot also needs to be done to make sure that uh, the monitoring is done, uh, you know, not actual, I mean, not de uh, jure, uh, but uh, de facto. Thank you very much. Um, and I see that um, Marlise uh, raised her hand. So Marlise, uh, you have the floor is yours. Thank you very much and thank you for this great discussion. Um, so I have a question. Um, we've spoken a lot about the benefits, the mutual benefits for the EU and Ukraine um, in this session, but the EU is often considered fairly ungovernable with its 27 members already. So if we look at um, key foreign policy decisions, they need a unanimous response, um, which the EU often cannot give. And I just wanted to ask if you think that um, down the road a bit, how will the Ukrainian people feel about giving up sovereignty in key areas after they've been fighting for control over their territory so bravely for these last months? Is that a concern as of right now? Can I answer shortly? And probably, probably yes. I will. <laughs> yes. Um, it's just I'm talking from the field as a war volunteer, as a person who witnessed death uh, personally, and not only that. Uh, if we don't have enough heavy weapons, we will all be very sorry for giving up territories. This is not the question for, for us as um, you know, leadership of Ukraine, parliamentarians, or those women and men who are fighting for the freedom with the guns. But I'm sorry, I have to say that we didn't discuss the military parts of the question, but it's a matter of fact, the heavy weapons, not only them, but also the heavy weapons can prevent us from giving up any territories and probably liberating the ones that do belong to us. We don't believe that, you know, a decision maker was a uh, surname starting with P will wake up one day and say, okay, today I give up 
uh, on my uh, weird strategies of imperialism and so, uh, getting together or how he call it bring it back together the lands uh, and i change my strategy that doesn't that definitely won't happen but on the top of everything this green light that might be granted on the 24th for us will be a red light for him so just to interconnecting everything I, I think that the same I would I think that if you if we would question people across across Ukraine right now there wouldn't be even one percent who would say we're willing to give up on our territories uh, I will give anything. you it was it was exactly my question in uh, accordance with the last uh, pool uh, 92 percent uh, uh, and they, this is the highest number which ever was in any pooling before and uh, 92 percent are right now are absolutely sure that we should become a part of european union uh, so th that this choice and this route is uh, is the right one and I just would like to remind uh, that uh, this war is ex it is exactly the reason of this, the biggest reason of this war, which started to 014, not now, is exactly uh, the European choice of Ukraine, nothing else. So, and uh, actually we had eight years to, you know, to think about it. And uh, we are pretty sure that our choice is absolutely right. Uh, and actually this choice, um, is made in a very complicated situation when we have very, very, very uh, specific neighbor, very specific, which is effectively an empire with, you know, methods and the philosophy of uh, um, mid years. I mean, I mean, like 90th century and probably even even older. So and um, we forced to choose and our choice is obvious. And it, it's, you know, it's paid by blood already. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, and next on my list um, is uh, Leah. Thank you so much for this so like such important discussion. And I want to ask, so how can other EU member states better support Ukraine on its path to EU membership? Like, are there any specific steps that could be taken by each country to support this very important mission? Thank you so much. I also have a short answer. It's just to vote on the 24th on the candidate status. Unfortunately, the rule hasn't changed uh, since the Treaty of the EU was established. It has to be unanimously voted, not a a majority vote, which, by the way, was suggested to be changed at the recent Conference of Europe in Strasbourg it being held in April, if I'm not mistaken. But we can't change this rule before the 24th, so the unanimity is the, is the answer for that, probably, as for now. I, I will expand Maria's uh, answer because it might be a little bit longer than just uh, this short answer. Help us to convince those countries that are hesitant. Uh, because there are a few that still haven't yet uh, make up the mind. And basically Germany is one of them. And today there was a, a very positive signal from my perspective. There was the statement which was issued by the three youth wings, no, the, the youth wings of three um, political parties that are members of, of the German coalition uh, supporting EU candidate status. And we know that in the established democracies, it, it matters. It makes sense what, what the youth is, is demanding. And this is also a very clear signal. Uh, also, we heard uh, from some of the coalition political parties that they are uh, supporting EU candidate status. So we very much expect that um, the chancellor will also make up his mind soon and hopefully tomorrow will uh, speak out very clearly about German support for the EU candidate. And, and if we have Germany, France on board, uh, other countries will, will, will join uh, faster. Um, and after the vote is casted and hopefully unanimously, um, what do you then um, expect as uh, support? I think it's a roadmap to follow after, and that's that's a mutual 
mutual job to be done on uh, uh, we of course know that there is a little bit extra uh, funds because to be very frank today a month of existence for Ukraine in terms of holding up to the salaries of teachers, those who work for government, doctors, those who serve for the army, it's cost between five and seven billion euros. That's where EU helps us to, to maintain ourselves. But that's, that's a, a huge cost. That's a huge cost. Therefore, uh, until, until the day we, we come back on the, on the regular economy track of um, normalization of ta tax incomes into the budget, that's very vital for us to um, to put it on a tactical uh, on a tactical uh, level of of existence of a state. Let's say so as a, as a step one. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Natalia. May I ask you because um, I mean, I mean, right now Ukraine is still in a, in, in, a, in an awful war. But after the war, reconstruction needs to kick in very, very quickly um, and rebuilding. Um, what, is, what is needed for that? Um, definitely, it would depend uh, when and how we will win. And definitely, it would depend when and how we would be able to start. Um, actually, I would use the world modernization rather than reconstruction. As far as uh, for Ukraine, uh, it's a big task to use uh, this big and uh, brave battle for um, our European future uh, also as a um, like platform uh, for transferring our economy. Uh, as you know, that uh, in Ukraine, we had a very big uh, industry part, industrial part, uh, including uh, Steel production. Uh, we are owners uh, of number of steel plants in Ukraine, and two of them are in Mariupol. Uh, one of them is Azovstal, which is uh, now unfortunately well known uh, all over the world. Uh, uh, it means that, uh, and you know, it's a symbol of uh, uh, of the strategy of Russia just to destroy everything. Uh, from one side, definitely, it's a huge loss and uh, we as a private business the biggest one in ukraine uh we would pioneer uh the court cases against russia and uh, uh, i think that we would announce uh, first uh, court uh, uh, case uh, next week exactly during not during but in the same time when uh the summit would take place and uh what we do need, as I said, we do need right now uh, huge institutional support uh, from uh, big financial institutions. But uh, after uh, uh, we start the modernization, we, def we definitely need and we would like to be interested strong investments, uh, private investments and strong uh, partnerships between Ukrainian and European business. Um, you know, I have very particular ideas. We have very, very practical discussions, but definitely energy sector is one of the most uh, high potential, uh, strategic for Europe, absolute strategic for Ukraine and uh, doable as far as uh, Ukrainian energy business is ready, European uh, uh, energy business is ready, uh, the necessity is obvious, so everything is ready. The same with uh, machine building, actually I do believe that we, Ukraine would be forced to build almost from the scratch. Uh, I don't know in English, probably my colleagues would help me, uh, uh, like production of weapon. And uh, definitely it's a huge sector. And uh, first of all, we're talking about the defense weapon and uh, oh, it's about technologies. So European countries, of course, uh, could and should be our partners in that. Uh, definitely, as far as we're talking about the food security, we would like to create uh, more effective and uh, uh, you know, more, um, more high, uh, added value uh, with more margin, more marginal uh, um, uh, production lines over here. As far as now, we are the biggest uh, supplier of the grain, but definitely we could do more. 
uh, probably this is the third sector uh, European uh, investors could focus on. So again, uh, reconstruction and modernization is uh, uh, something which should be done uh, both by institutional and private money. Uh, like Lafarge is uh, already here, but definitely it would be a lot of stuff. Big construction companies, companies which uh, European companies which are specialized on steel building because uh, it's something new for Ukraine, but absolutely unavoidable. Countries which are in machinery and mainly uh, in uh, building, uh, uh, you know, uh, machinery which is needed for defense industry. So like that. Uh, and of course, and of course, another one, uh, another one uh, huge uh, direction is logistic. So probably some companies like Deutsche Bahn, definitely Deutsche Bahn is not not, not an investor, but uh, Deutsche Bahn is, uh, uh, you know, in a long conversation with uh, Ukrainian railways to create a joint project. Such kind of cooperation is also something which I do believe would take a place, not could, but would. Thank you very much. We are coming very close to the end of our session today, um, but there's one last question um, and I would like to give the floor to Emily Schreier. Yeah, thank you um, for this opportunity. I was wondering, sort of going back to the original, you know, idea about like joining the EU. Um, and I understand this is a bit of like a loaded uh, maybe question, but I hope you understand where I'm coming from. I was wondering if from your side, um, if there are any concerns about like potentially joining the EU and getting into the process of joining the EU that that could take um, important bargain power from the negotiations for peace with uh, Russia. And if we could talk about that a little bit. And this question is uh, addressed to anybody specifically on our panel or? Um, I guess it's uh, more in general. I, I assume, yeah, it's, no one is a specialist on that, but I guess for you who do work in the political field or are Ukrainians is that something that you that is a topic even I, I could I, I could uh, do a small remark and probably colleague would uh, build on that um, you know I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a communication person so I work with words and with messages one of the biggest messages of Russian propaganda is that Ukraine is alone Ukraine don't want Ukraine, uh, Europe don't want Ukraine, uh, Europe actually cheat us, leave us alone. And uh, exactly this type of IPSO, special informational, uh, spe special information operations is so something which they do because it could uh, give them strength. So the signal that uh, Europe uh, uh, wants Ukraine, uh, that Europe, uh, value Ukrainian effort very high that Europe is ready to you know to, to invite Ukraine to European family uh, is something which definitely will strengthen our positions in any kind of negotiations any uh, especially now uh, <clears throat> colleagues I'm sure that Minsk two Minsk uh, sorry Minsk Minsk one Minsk, Minsk two someone was talking just before the war about pushing Ukraine to implement Minsk three, and we're thanking, we're so thankful for the leadership of, of the Normandy format of Germany and France in that sense that it wasn't accepted whatsoever in December, which paved the way, uh, well, for the change of the plans for Putin possibly. So, we have seen that the negotiations couldn't couldn't be supervised with successful outcome by the OEC, even though it's a trusted organization with a high mandate for the purpose. It couldn't be just a B2B conversation, even though President Zelensky from the day one in his office offered that and Putin refused many times. Uh, therefore, um, I think, Emily, your question is trying to link uh, a, a possibility of geographical pacho European integration of Ukraine, which is linking us back to Anika's comment on the uh, occupied territories and, and wider perspective. But I think we are living in a in a world uh, where it was recognized the borders of 1991 and the full stop. So uh, not going into, into the details, 
that's that's a question of the very tough negotiations that took place face to face several times in Minsk, even though it was it was not the best time, uh, sorry, not the, the best location it was very dangerous for our delegation even to be there. But uh, now we can talk about it because some members of parliament were directly involved in the negotiations Mario, in Mariupol face to face to the Russian delegation, which poses a question of their expertise because, you know, a former minister of culture and all that, you know, how professional are there to discuss such issues. So uh, they, are, they are going on right now. You remember a uh, media comment of the Russian side, even though they shouldn't have done that, that they're out, that Ukraine is out of the negotiations. So we are never, we are never betraying international humanitarian law, Geneva conventions and all that, whereas they do. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's so many other aspects I would love to ask you and discuss, um, but our time is unfortunately already over. Um, I would like to hand over for some last words to Dennis, but not before I thank again our wonderful panelists, not just for being here today, but for being so brave, for being brave on the ground, um, for fighting for, um, for our common values, um, for fighting for our European family to which Ukraine belongs, definitely without any question. Um, and I want to thank you very, very much um, for, being, for being who you are and for being so brave. Um, and um, with this, I um, hand over for, to Dennis for some very last words. Yeah, thank you very much, Stormy. Uh, you know, um, it was a very interesting conversation and I think that we will make use of it uh, in the future because it was a, like a quite concise uh, and comprehensive probably picture uh, of the status of your uh, European accession of Ukraine. So, uh, and I'm glad that uh, despite all the tragic events that we are witnessing now in our country, uh, that we can think about our common future about our uh, you know developments uh, and in a very positive way uh, so i am also very grateful to all our speakers for their patience and their uh, great ideas and uh, professionalism uh, and also i thank to aspen institute germany and ukrainian aspen institute for this conversation so let's be strong and let's stay together and in case you are in Berlin next Monday, join us for our um, uh, summer festival meeting, uh, which we will have in the afternoon and evening. Um, we also will have a, um, there's going to be a fun and nice part where we can all get together um, and just enjoy being together again. But we also will have a very um, insightful discussion again on Ukraine um, with two German parliamentarians and also a representative from Ukraine. And we want to talk about what Germany is doing with regard to the Zeitenwende um, and if we are doing enough and expectations and stumbling blocks and um, hopefully also having a positive outlook. So join us next week um, on the ground on site. Thank you so much to all of uh, our participants joining us today. Um, spread the word that this uh, meeting is going to be on YouTube um, and it's definitely worth looking at. So thank you so much. Uh, thanks to my team for putting it together and I hope to see you all of you soon. Um, stay healthy, stay safe, especially our friends in Ukraine and um, good luck to all of us. <laughs>